Welcome to PCR TV, uh, talking about the first landmark trial, Triluminate, and we will have in this first session a deep dive into the protocol and the trial itself. It's my great pleasure to host this session together with Nicole Karam uh, from Paris. Uh, my name is Ross Stefan von Bardleben from Mainz University, and we will be interviewing the trial protagonists and PIs of the study, which is Paul Suraja from Minneapolis and David Adams uh, from New York. And it's my great pleasure to start into uh, this interview uh, with Paul. Uh, first of all, congratulations for this first randomized trial on tricuspic valve regurgitation treatment that met his endpoint. Could you highlight a little bit the trial design? What were the inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, to start with? Well, thank you, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, so the trial really focused on enrolling patients with severe and symptomatic TR. They had to have uh, an intermediate or greater risk of cardiac surgery, as estimated by the local heart team, and they needed stable guideline-directed medical therapy for at least 30 days. So really an ambulatory setting for patients with TR. Uh, the key exclusion criteria, we made sure that there was no indication for near the valve intervention, there was no pulmonary hypertension, the EFs were more than 20, and we also wanted to be sure the anatomy was suitable for the therapy through anatomic review. That's a very important part, and I think these patients were at intermediate and high risk, so this is a decision that was made in the heart team, so I think this question is, goes best to uh, David Adams. Yeah. Uh, what is this patient group in your clinical practice, and how do you see the need for therapy and for this trial uh, in detail? David. Stefan, I think the patients in, our, in, in the trial were were white patients we see in clinic with the caveat I think they were a little bit healthier than some of the patients that we see and what I mean by that is is that as Paul explained the main criteria here for enrollment was you, you didn't have untreated valve disease although 40 percent of patients had, had undergone previous left sided valve treatment um, and they had symptomatic severe TR and I think that the patients that we saw had you know, we didn't see as much end-stage right heart failure, for example, and of course, we, and we didn't see as much liver dysfunction as we would see in our clinic. Um, and, but of course, these patients are, you know, if you take the, the spectrum of patients, it's a bell curve. I think we're, we're sort of right in the middle where we were seeing sort of an average patient that has this, that's not at the end stage where they're really not, where they're tricuspid valve disease at the end stage, but the sepulae from it were not at the mm -hmm. end stage. And yeah. I think that was, is the best way for us to look at it. But this is such an unmet need. These patients, I don't think anyone wants to, to have to put them through surgery. And one of the points that I think is so important stuff on is what it takes to get one of these patients through. Meaning they come in the hospital, you do intravenous diuretics and pre-optimization, you keep them in the intensive care unit for several days. These, they really need a lot of support to get through uh, an operation. And of course, this procedure is not done, is done, there's a wide distribution of how many times a year centers do this procedure. So if you're in an advanced valve center, then you'll have a much better chance of getting through that. But of course, that's not the real world for all of these patients. So the need for a treatment that is less invasive and carries a high safety profile as compared to surgery is profound. And that's why we were so excited to be in this trial and, and to have a chance to present the outcomes. Great points, David. Thank you very much. And I, I would hand over again to Paul uh, to ask, so we have seen it was a number of 350 patients looked at, and uh, David was already addressing this a little bit. Yeah. A little bit healthier, so we saw an event rate that was surprisingly low. And uh, the study met its uh, primary endpoint, but it met it with the third hierarchical endpoint, which was quality of life. Very sustainable, very high win ratio here, but it missed a little bit on the more outcome related situations mm -hmm. like mortality, uh, on the valvular surgery 
And the second point was heart failure hospitalization, which was a little bit surprising mm -hmm. to me also. So could you highlight a little bit yeah. why this has been seen in this trial? Well, I think it's, it's very natural when we think about severe symptomatic valve disease that there should be an impairment in survival and its correction should be associated with an improvement. But you know, I think one thing to keep in mind is that this is the first clinical investigation of TR and it's the first randomized trial testing TR reduction and its impact on survival. So while I believe that these patients were not healthy, they were impaired, and that's why they had improvement, uh, the, this is a trial that, in terms of the spectrum of medicine, it's the first right-sided investigation. And, and that's important. We can't really assume that what we've done and practiced for decades on the left side is the same on the right side. A very important point made, and I would yeah. like to highlight that we have a very juvenile technique. It was first done on humans in 2015, 2016. Yeah. This trial started as a randomized control trial already in 2019 and yeah. finished enrollment in 2021. Yeah. So I think it has been a very fast enrollment, but we had two thirds of the trial under COVID conditions. That's right. Can you highlight a little bit whether this may have affected the heart failure hospitalization. It was also possible to have less than 24 hour heart failure hospitalizations. Yeah. Were they rather deferred by the COVID pandemic, even if yeah. the patient was not infected himself? Well, it's very interesting. So other heart failure trials have had a significant impact in COVID, but unfortunately in our circumstance, as you point out, nearly all patients were enrolled during the COVID pandemic. So we don't have a before and after COVID effect to do that sensitivity analysis. Uh, I will say that the rates of heart failure hospitalization were lower than what we had anticipated in the, in, the, in the calculations. Whether that was due to COVID, better medical therapy, or just false assumptions of right versus left sided disease, I, I can't say which one it was, but probably some combination of all those. Looking into yeah. the supplement, we also saw that the medication actually yeah. changed. So which can be beneficial to the patient, yeah. but which can also be disbeneficial for the device group. Yeah. So what I noticed was that there was an increasing number of patients that were put off or lowered with diuretics mm -hmm. massively in the mm -hmm. device group. So this started with about 6%, went over to 9%. In the end, it was about 16, 17% mm -hmm. less diuretic at high doses in That's the device right. group than the control group. Could this have also influenced the trial? Absolutely, uh, because I think that diuretics in themselves, they're just not really benign drugs. You know, we, there's no cardiovascular trial that's ever been shown to improve survival from diuretics. They're simply palliative medications. And the lifestyle issues that happen with diuretics, it's quite significant. We have elderly folks that are subjected to these really quite aggressive loop doses um, that could be not just 40 milligrams, can be 80, 120, even 240. And they suffer from these metabolic derangements, the resistance, the breaking phenomenon, lots of different things that can happen with these diuretics. And so in and of itself, the fact that the diuretic dosing was lower, I think actually helped the quality of life too. Okay. Nicole, what do you think is the main perception in the European community uh, looking from outside the study investigator group, what was your main feedback on the presentation yesterday and what was your feedback on the study protocol being developed that early actually after only two years of human procedures we have to say? I mean, uh, regarding, regarding the protocol in Europe and in France, we have a, another study going on with very close protocol types. So mm. the even inclusion and exclusion criteria are very, very close. Mm. For the result per se, I mean, we were expecting a little bit more uh, objective results regarding mm. hospital admissions. But again, quality of life is very important. It was correlated with the improvement of TR, so I don't think that it was just a placebo effect. So I guess the overall intake that we have from uh, that we get from the study is very positive. Mm -hmm. So we will have to wait for more results, but yeah. it's very positive. That's a perfect final word, and I would like to conclude that we have seen here the first ever randomized controlled trial for tricuspic therapy uh, in regurgitation patients at a possibly slightly healthier cohort 
that may be the real world cohort, but it's extremely safe with a mortality of 0.6%. It was able to achieve an 87% reduction in mm -hmm. TR down to moderate or mild, which was beneficial on the quality of life measured by the KCCQ and the study met its primary endpoint. Thank you very much for this nice discussion and we'll continue later in a second interview on the perspectives of the cohort at two years uh, and perspectives for the treatment. Thank you very much from PCR TV.